the shadows and the valleys when the hardest battles coming at me, rushing in like a flood. In the darkness where my heart is, in the hardest moments I've imagined, still I know who you are. Cause you are the God of the valleys You're the God in the storm And through every battle Yes, I know who you are You're my anchor of hope In the rage of the sea You are the God who fights for me
Good day, Horizon. How are we all doing? Does everyone need to just take a deep breath? <sighs> and, and we still don't know, as of our filming, who will be the next president of the United States of America. But so glad that we do know who rules and who reigns. And the word of the Lord is very clear. God is on the throne. And he is not biting his nails. And... Uh, we want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. If we haven't met, my name is Steve Armanderas, one of the pastors here at Horizon. And this is my lovely wife, Sarah. And uh, we got something special going on later this month. Oh, sorry. Yeah. An anniversary coming up. Anniversary, 28th anniversary on the 28th. Is that like called the golden or something I like think that? So. I think so. I always thought golden anniversary was like 50th, but everyone says no, it's like you're. When you got married, that wedding date, whatever date that is. So anyway, are you shopping early? Yeah, I already got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Well, um, love to have you open up God's Word, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, we are in uh, verses 17 through 32 tonight. Lesson 7, put off and put on. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity, uh, Lord, just to settle our hearts before you, Lord, just to draw near to you, just to draw close to you, Lord, to hear your word. And uh, Father, we would just pray as in the midst of just such a um, tense week for so many, for all of us, really, in, in one sense of just wondering who um, will be elected president, Lord, that we can turn our hearts and our eyes to you. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just quiet us now, Lord, that we would hear your voice, hear from heaven, Lord, that in our time, you would be glorified. We thank you, Father, as your word declares that your truth brings freedom and hope and peace and healing and comfort. Lord, have your way. We just pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Sarah, you want to read the uh, first few verses there? Absolutely. So Ephesians 4, I'm going to be starting in verse 17 through 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk in the rest, as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God 
because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Mm. You know, throughout the book of Ephesians, there's five times it, it talks about how we walk. And in Ephesians chapter 2, if you want to turn there, beginning in verse 1, it said this, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We talked about that several weeks ago. But really, uh, this picture that the scripture paints for us, if we are unregenerate, if we have not been born again, born from above, if the spirit of God is not living in us, we are dead. And you, he made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins. And the Bible would say that all of the world is under the slavery, under the bondage of the devil and spiritual death comes. And it's almost like, well, we're physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. It's almost like these zombies that are walking and uh, living their life. And, you know, if you're living a life without God, in the scripture's perspective, we are dead. And so we should no longer walk according to the course of this world. And then here we see... Um, in uh, Ephesians 2.10, because we're different, because Christ is in us, we're to walk in good works. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says that we should walk worthy of the calling that we have in Christ Jesus. And so again, here in verse 17, Paul's reminding us that we should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And we're to be different. There's a different perspective. There's a different way of looking at things. And uh, Pastor Bob and Bonnie will be uh, uh, sharing with us next week and from Ephesians 5, and it talks about walking in love and that beautiful passage on marriage. And, and uh, it speaks of also walking circumspectly, walking carefully, soberly in chapter 5 as well, these ideas of how we are to walk. And, you know, it's just, uh, I think sometimes we lose perspective of who we were prior to meeting Christ. We're dead. We were walking dead. And we meet Christ, and his life is now in us, and it should make a difference in the way uh, that we walk. Sarah, any thoughts on that, or do you want to move on to verses 20 mm -hmm. and 24? I think, I think you covered it. That's all right, good. all right. You want to read on? Sure. And verse 20 through 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Mm. Mm. Good stuff there. What, what uh, jumps off the page for yeah. you there? Definitely that contrast, right, of mm. what we're supposed to put off. That old man, we saw that in verse 22. And, and then um, the beautiful thing of the reminder to put on. And I, I love how God's word reminds us that there's an action, right, that's mm. involved. And that we have to intentionally know that we are new in Christ. And that we, that old nature and that old sinful, sin nature should be gone. And we should be allowing Christ to dwell in us. And I think of um, Paul's writing in 1 Peter chapter 4 that also is a reminder of the contrast. And in 1 Peter 4 verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Mm. And then um, it continues in verse 6 there in First Peter, and it, it says to live according to God in the Spirit. And I really believe that's a key because we see that phrasing again in verse 23 of Ephesians where we are, to be renewed in the Spirit of your mind, to put that into action, to 
actively be seeking God's will. And the quote on page 88 where um, Charles Spurgeon remind us, so if you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you must live with him. Mm -hmm. And that concept of, of abiding in him and dwelling with him and to be transformed by the renewing of our mind as Romans 12 tells us. Mm -hmm. So again, that renewed in the spirit, renewed in the mind, and be transformed then. So putting off that old and putting on the new. Yeah, I love that. In verse 20 and 21, it talks about, um, hey, you know, that old man, that's not what Christ taught us. That's the fallen nature. And, um, and that he does teach us, verse 21, if indeed you've been uh, heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You know, we're not who we used to be. Um, I remember when I was in high school, you know, I do not like musicals, but it's interesting to me how those musicals have sometimes stuck with me all these years later. And I remember going in high school, and the only reason I went to watch this play was because one of my friends was in it, and it was My Fair Lady. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was an adaptation, of, of, for those of you who know George Bernard Shaw, from, I think in 1913, it was called Pygmalion. And... Uh, it has been remade so many times, this storyline. And so in My Fair Lady, it became really popular in 1964, a young Audrey Hepburn played uh, Miss Eliza Doolittle. And the storyline is this, that there's this pompous phonetics professor, Henry Higgins, and he is so sure of his abilities that he can take and transform this uh, lowly, cockney, working class girl, Eliza Doolittle, who was played by Audrey Hepburn, uh, to become this cultured lady and an accepted member of high society. And there's this wager that has happened. And this storyline has been used by so many movies in Hollywood over time. I mean, uh, Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, even Eddie Murphy's Trading Places, a variation on that. And, and there are so many other adaptations of this. But, you know, to be able to, that, that whole storyline that this is, you know, you're just this not very sophisticated, kind of, uh, you know, lower class person who doesn't know how to talk, doesn't know how to act, and that I can train you to become some sophisticated, amazing thing. And, and you know, that's not what it's saying here in verse 21 mm -hmm. and, and 20. We should be trained, we should be changed, but the change and the transformation is if Christ is living in yes. us, right we have been radically transformed. He has taken us from death to life. Mm -hmm. And so that old nature is still in us that likes to do things that are not pleasing to God. And so the hope is that we would be so transformed by the truth and the truth would help us to understand and realize who it is that we are. I think of John chapter 8, verse 32, it says this, And you, Jesus said, shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We are already free, we're already perfected in Christ, but our old nature, that old zombie that likes to do things that are not pleasing to God, is still alive and well. And zombies like to go out and have fun again and again and again and keep living. And you shoot it and it, and it goes away for a while and then it comes back. And, and you know, it's just this type of our flesh and the old nature and the old man and, and that encouragement that we put off the old man, and that we put on the new man that is uh, according to Christ and what it is that he desires. And, you know, I thought that uh, the homework did a great job just in this um, Spurgeon quote on page 87 in our, in our wonderful workbook, if you have that. In page 87, um, it says this, We were considering the Christian idea of putting on Christ, what I want to make clear is that this is not one among many jobs a Christian has to do. It is the whole of Christianity. It's who Christ made us to be. And it's our nature and our name. And so the old man knows, doesn't know those things, so we draw near to Christ. We draw near to the truth of God's word, and it changes and transforms us. I love that story of speaking of the, you know, English and a fine cultured woman uh, there's a story about Queen Victoria of England, who was a great queen. And 
But when she was a child, she was pretty unruly. In fact, she was brutal. She was mean. She would intentionally act in a disobedient way and would blame it on other people, other kids. And so she would laugh when other kids would get in trouble. And, and Victoria says that the most transforming moment of her life was when her governess took her aside and said to her, Victoria, you are the future queen of England. When will you begin to act as the future queen of England? You see, the Lord just doesn't say, hey, change this behavior, change that behavior, things are messy. He says, I have made you an heir. I have made you my child. You've been grafted into the family of God. We've been looking at that in these previous chapters. And so if that's who you are, put off the old. You're not that person anymore. Put on the new, and it's different. And it should make a difference because you and I will rule and reign with Christ. We are kings and priests. And, and it's a mind-blowing thing uh, to, to understand and, and acknowledge what the word of the Lord tells us about our future. And so, you know, we kind of transition. And, and so if I put off the old, now I'm putting on the new. What does that look like practically? And verses 25 through 32, the remainder of our time, we'll look at this. And practically, what does it look like? Sarah, you want to read that for us? Yes. So chapter 4, Ephesians, verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Hmm. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Mm. Great What passage. does it look like practically? Right. And, you know, I will tell you, um, when we were working on the schedule and I, I just saw this passage, this section of scripture, I probably, uh, there's probably not a week that goes by if we're in the office and, and someone comes in for counseling and whatnot, uh, that I don't go to this passage of Scripture just because it is so practical and so much of what people struggle with is found in these seven verses uh, right here. And the first encouragement, therefore putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor if we are members of one another. Oh, it's just a little white lie. There is no such thing. And when we lie, it's the old man. The old man is living a lie, thinking that they're alive, they're actually dead. And, and there's so many things that we could say about that. Uh, the Bible tells us that the devil is the father of all lies. And so if I'm telling a lie or living a lie or presenting a lie, I'm misrepresenting who God is and his character and his nature. And uh, there is no such thing as a, it's just a little white lie. Just share the truth. Why? Because we're members of one another. We're and it's not like it's a surprise to God. And um, man, lying, such a, a huge problem. We want to make ourselves look better than we are. Or we want to make someone look worse than they are. Uh, and it's, it's grievous to the Lord. That's the old man. And the new man is one who doesn't lie. It also says um, in verse 26, to be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place uh, to the devil. It's interesting here that hmm, anger is inevitable. We get angry. Mm -hmm. Someone makes us mad, this fallen world, this, the, the, the political climate in our country. There's so many things that can make mm -hmm. us angry. And being angry is not the sin. Staying angry is. We get angry but don't stay angry. You know, uh, Sarah and I, we met with a, a gal um, this week and she's going through a really difficult time. And 
Her husband gets so angry at her, he will not speak to her for a month on end, months on end, living in the same home, being in the same place, and ignoring and completely, just like you're not even there. And let me just say that the heart of God, the will of God, the new man, putting on the new man, says deal with it before you go to bed. And if you go to bed and you're still angry, clearly, straight up, it's sin. And not only that, but the next verse says in verse 27, nor give place to the devil. If I go to bed angry, if I'm upset, and I take it to bed with me, the devil now has a place to war against me. Now, this is kind of controversial to some Christians because, oh man, the devil can like possess me. Now, we do not believe, a Christian, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot be possessed by the devil, controlled, dominated by the devil. But, if I do not deal with my anger, my rage, if I'm intentionally, willfully continuing in sin, I have given the devil a place. Literally, the word place there, topos, like we used, and, and see the topographical map. It shows the elevation and, and contours, and you have, have given the devil a physical place, not to possess, but to oppress, to rob you of the peace and the joy. And that's the old man. And the devil still has that foothold. And it's when I'm holding on to that anger and going to bed with it, it really um, has a significant impact in my life. Um, Sarah, there's so much more in this passage. I, I know I've got more to share about it, but I just want to hear any thoughts from you. Definitely. It's, it's just a great reminder. It's so clear what God expects as far as what you shared to speak that truth, to not be angry to not steal, um, that our words, every word, especially in verse 29, let no corrupt word. So a word, whether it be just empty words, whether it be um, derogatory, whether it be negative, he says not to, to use corrupt words, not to use casual words, but that if we look at it, that our words should be a gift, right? That we should choose well, and that we should choose ones that would encourage and uplift. I remember when our kids were younger, um, definitely, I, I think you see that, right, in children. It's very easy for them to be, to lie, to get angry, and all of those things. But one of the verses that I know meant a lot to me as a mom and trying to train our kids was verse 32. And to, to simply instruct them to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, and um, forgiving one another to know that that's done in love. And the only way you can forgive someone else is if you understand and know that you've first been loved. But with, with little kids, they didn't fully understand the fullness of God's word, but I knew that his word, word wouldn't return void. So I remember when the kids maybe would call each other a name or be unkind, I'd make them face each other and literally have to say this verse to one another. And then I also encouraged them. I says, you know, God's made you smarter and more creative than just using those adjectives or those words. So now you get to come up with 10 better mm -hmm. words. And I think that's the concept that even as adults, we need to understand we put off, we take off that old man, but now we're gonna put on. And so actively really choosing um, to allow God's spirit to work in us and to not use words that would be derogative. Mm. And there was a couple words, the S words mm. were not allowed in our home, but that actually was shut up and stupid. Uh, we're not allowed, there's another S word as well. But anyway, just understanding that words don't have to be empty. And it was fascinating last year, um, our daughter and myself, we were taking a motorcycle safety class, which is another story all in itself. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, She's a licensed motorcycle. It's basically, through that process, you're with a lot of other people and you're in a, in a group. And there happened to be an individual in our group who his words were not um, edifying or encouraging. Hmm. Um, and what was fascinating to me is that he would say the word, then he'd look at us and say, oh, pardon my language. But I'm thinking, well, you're not really sorry or pardoning your language because you're not changing it. Mm. And so finally, um, I just, I kind of looked at him and I grinned and I said, you know, if you were one of my kids, I would actually have you say 10 positive words instead of those words. And, and he kind of laughed. But the whole point is that, that 
our words as, and I think of another verse, Colossians 3, 6, where it says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Mm. And I think of the beauty that God wants our words to be encouragement and that love is that motivating factor to being kind to one another, tender-hearted, And it's not a selfish ambition or, a, you know, I, putting myself first. And um, just one of the other quotes that I think in this passage and section of the homework that stood out to me, one of my favorites, C.S. Lewis, when he says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. Hmm. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. Hmm. That's powerful, isn't it? To do away with it. And it, he continues to say, I will give you a new self instead. Mm. In fact, I will give you myself, mm. Christ speaking. My own will shall become yours. And that's what this passage of putting off the new man, putting mm. on the new man, and then walking, how do we live it out, mm. is um, leading, living in obedience to God. You know, that... Uh that call in verse 29 is, is tough because, mm -hmm. uh, man, some of us have been greatly hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, you're watching. Maybe someone has greatly hurt you, ripped you off, robbed you intentionally, and are taking advantage of you, maybe even oppressing you or uh, taking advantage of the situation. And wait, it says, let no corrupt word in verse 29 proceed out of your mouth. Man, when someone calls me a name, I want to call them a name or think certainly bad names. And um, man, the power, Proverbs uh, 20, uh, 18, 21 says, the power of life and death mm -hmm. are in the tongue. And man, I think back over words that I've heard in my lifetime, and man, some of them, that, that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. <laughs> words do hurt. Yeah. What you hear people say about you, it, it does hurt. And uh, you know, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. If someone has hurt me, I'm not to tear them down like I want to, but the word edification means to build up. What? That it may impart grace to the hearers. And really this call, if we put off the old and we put on the new, as Christ has forgiven us. We were dead. We were worse than Eliza Doolittle, who couldn't talk. And, and actually, the storyline is that she was actually a, a woman of the night. She was a prostitute. And, you know, the Bible tells us that in our sin, in our depravity, we are no better than Eliza Doolittle. In fact, we are guilty. We are sinners. We are worthy and deserving of death and eternity separated from, from, from God forever. But his grace, mm -hmm. while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And he poured out his grace. He poured out his love to change us and to transform us. And as we have been given grace, we are called to give that same grace. And the power of life and death in the tongue um, is just such an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know... It, it goes on there in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I was thinking about that, you know, to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Um, and what is it that grieves me as a parent? Well, it's when, or actually, what is, what is it that grieves me about myself? It grieves me when I know that I'm a Christian. I know that Christ has forgiven everything, and I act contrary to that. I know that what grieves me about my kids, sometimes when we would hear them say something, like one of the S words, <laughs> ah, and we got to talk to them, and, and you know, it's, it's grievous. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We've been forgiven, and so when we don't act in that same manner, it's grievous um, to the Lord. I oftentimes uh, share the story of... Uh, it was like 1997, 1998, somewhere around there. And we went to, um, it, there was so much rain that year up in the Sierras. And, and I, I love to fish. I love to fly fish. And so uh, a buddy of mine and I, the, the, the passes weren't even open until like late August. I mean, there was, I think there was like over 100 feet of snow in Mammoth that year. And so the passes, they opened like late August. And we go up to one of the high mountain lakes. And 
and we're fishing, and it was just a beautiful day, and, if, and, and there's these stepstone lakes and certain vantage points, and you can, you're there fishing a lake, it's crystal clear water, you can see the fish swimming in some of them, and then out of that lake will, will flow a waterfall or a stream, and it'll go down in a creek, and then down below it'll fill another lake, and then there's another lake down below and stepstone. There's certain vantage points where you could see these lakes kind of stacked up. And I was like, man, this is amazing, beautiful. Blue sky, white puffy clouds, and the snow is melting and filling this lake, and, and it was just gorgeous. And then I kind of turned this way behind me, and I see this pond. I actually, I thought it was a putting green. <laughs> I thought it was a putting green. It was green. And I was like, what is that? That doesn't belong here in this place. And I walk over to it, and it's not a putting green. It's a pond. And it's covered with a thick scum of moss. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that same snow melt, crystal clear white snow is melting into this beautiful lake over here. And the fish are happy and everyone's good. And the same snow on this side of the ridge is coming in and it's going into this little pond. Why is it so clear over here and why is it so messed up over here? And I started thinking about it and I walked around that entire little pond and you know what the difference was this. The lake was receiving that snow melt and it was letting it out. And this pond was receiving that same crystal clear snow melt, but guess what? There was high banks around that entire thing and there was no place of escape for it. And it stagnated and it got stinky and it got nasty. And I really believe that I, the, the Holy Spirit has just used that as a reminder to me of what it is to grieve the Holy Spirit. We have been forgiven of so much. And yeah, we've been hurt, some of us greatly, by someone else. When we hold on to it, we stagnate. But if we would, the grace that God has given us, let it flow freely to others, it's transforming. It's powerful. And not only that, but the moment you let go of what you receive, guess what? You make room for a fresh new supply of the grace of God. That's the new man. The Lord desires that we would not stay stuck in the old man, the angry, bitter, selfish, all of those things, evil speaking, but be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. It wouldn't make any sense unless Jesus did what he did mm -hmm. for us. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on, on that as we kind of move to wrap up? It's good. God's word is good. That mm. Putting off and then choosing to put on the new mm. man in Christ. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but uh, about, well, last December, we got a call from a guy who was a, a doctor of our son up in Washington. And uh, he now lives in D.C., but, and he tracked us down and he shared with me something that I'll never forget. And I will tell you, it's been very challenging in many ways to get this news, but he told me, uh, Steve, I want to apologize. And I was like, apologize? What? Why are you apologizing? Well, I'm sorry that I was a part of a hospital that was negligent in the care for your son. And a long story short, um, it was national news. There was a fungus at Children's Hospital in Seattle. And it was covered up. And the engineers that discovered it were fired. And massive cover-up. And kids have died from this. And our own son, Josiah, who was born with a seizure disorder, was um, getting better with treatment. And we were in the hospital in 2004, and our son was in, uh, came down with this fungus. And he ended up having fungal lesions in his lungs. He had fungal lesions in his brain. And the recovery that he was making took a radical turn. And at that point, multiple pneumothoraxes. He was, we were told to say goodbye. Miraculously, he lived. He survived. And so this doctor who treated our son, we had no knowledge. We had no knowledge that this had happened. 
tells us that, I'm sorry, that this massive cover-up has gone on. And so with that, all of a sudden now, there's attorneys in Seattle that are contacting us. And there's a class action suit, and, and we're just thinking, what on earth? What? And I will tell you, I'm being honest, I was angry. And we met with what a guy that's probably considered to be one of the top trial lawyers in, in the country. And let's just say they told us, you have a significant case. And that was very difficult. And in my flesh, anger, I have a right, we have a right, or we've been wronged, and we've sought godly counsel, and we had counsel that suggested this way and counsel that suggested that way. And it's hard. Every day it's hard. The word of the Lord says the new man is one who's kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I just feel that the Holy Spirit prompted me to do that. And you know, when we made the decision that we are not going to pursue this, I can tell you, it's a decision I got to remake every day sometimes because there's a part of me that gets angry, but I just say, Lord, thank you for your grace. Mm -hmm. And thank you that I can give grace to someone else. Life is fresh and beautiful when we walk in the grace of the Lord and it gets nasty and stagnated and stinky when we hold on. Even if we want justice, but to give it to the Lord. And, uh, you know, as we pray, maybe there's someone or something that you're angry at, holding on to, you need to forgive. The Lord desires to bring freedom and healing and peace. And the grace that he has given you, we're called to extend that out. And there's freedom in that. Sarah, would you close us in prayer? Mm. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that does come and that you have made us new. We are new creatures in Christ and you. Lord, we ask that you would give us the power, the courage to live that out on a daily basis. Lord, that we would allow the old man to be put aside and that we would embrace the living spirit of God and Lord, I'm, I know that it's many times we want it to be um, a completed work right now so that we could arrive. And yet, Lord, you are constantly working on us. So I pray each day we would seek you, we would look to you, we would remember the truths of your word and that we would choose to be kind to one another, to be tenderhearted, to be forgiving just as you and Christ forgave us. Thank you for the power of your word. And I ask that you would bless these individuals that are listening pray that the truth of your word would penetrate our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. In your name we pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. Freedom is possible. It's in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Putting off the old selfish, angry, bitter, going to bed angry and waking up mm -hmm. angry. God brings freedom and peace as we walk in his grace. Put on the new man. We need him. It's not us. It's mm -hmm. him. And he can change us and transform us. We will rule and reign with him forever. Be blessed. God bless you.